going to be talking about oaks and acorns, and um, I'm going to hand over to Paul to talk more about galls um, and all things oak. Um, I just want to echo what Hannah said. We're really happy that you're all here tonight. We're grateful to have, um, have you here on a Thursday night with us. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start broadly with what oaks are in general when we talk about them. Um, oaks are in the family, uh, the beech family, and we're going to talk tonight about um, specifically the genus Quercus. Um, apparently it comes from two Celtic words that I guess translates to fine tree, which is mm, maybe a little generic, but they sure, they definitely are fine trees. Um, there's more than 500 species worldwide, but all of those are in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and there's 21 species native to California. Um, and there's something really cool about oak trees with regards to species and how they're defined. I'm gonna talk about the species kind of as they're usually defined in your average tree book or your field guide. Um, Paul will go into a more nuanced um, picture of oak species that's really interesting, but I'm gonna start kind of at the beginner level. Uh, oaks have acorns, which um, those are the seed of the oak, of course, and they're also considered a nut, which I think most people know the indigenous people here, um, that was their primary food source for thousands of years. Um, oak trees have distinct flowers uh, on the same tree. They have male and female species, um, and they're wind pollinated. So um, oaks are some of those species that when they are in flower, um, if your car is parked nearby, they, they're one of the contributors of a lot of that yellow pollen you see. Um, they have a strong and really complex wood. The oaks in California particularly have, I mean, they are really gnarled. Um, if you looked at the wood or the trunk, um, at sort of the aspect of their limbs, they are very kind of, um, they reach out in interesting ways. Um, and on the one hand, that made it so that they were not useful for timber um, when settlers were coming and um, clearing the land for agriculture. Um, but they did figure out that you could cut down oak and make charcoal out of them. So um, their fate wasn't totally spared, but they're not really great for timber in this area. Um, and given the right circumstances, they can live for centuries. Um, and the image I have here is um, this block artist uh, named Yoshiko Yamamoto, and she does a lot of um, local flora. She does a lot of California flora and California landscapes, and if you've never seen her work, it's really beautiful. Um, okay, um, so I'm going to talk specifically about California oaks, and actually oaks in our region more, more specifically. Um, but there's actually good fossil evidence that the oaks that we recognize today were pretty much all present in North America by about 10 million years ago. So these trees have been um, building an ecosystem in our landscape for millions of years. And when we see the animals and um, all the interesting creatures that make their homes in and around and because of oaks, it's worth thinking about how long those evolutionary relationships have been going on. Um, and humans also have been part of this ecological relationship. Um, it looks like the modern geographic range of local oak trees um, settled around 10,000 years ago um, when oaks in some areas sort of um, were competing for ecological space with a lot of conifer species. Um, and humans also became part of the natural landscape here close to that time. It was the end of the Ice Age. Um, and it's becoming increasing, increasingly recognized um, how much effect the humans who interacted with this environment really shaped it and stewarded it. Um, we, I think most people are starting to be familiar with the concept that uh, indigenous burning, uh, burning practices helped keep a lot of the grasslands that we recognize um, and that Europeans recognized when they came here. Um, they, those weren't sort of a natural random environment free of humans. The humans actually cultivated those open grasslands for hunting um, and for the health of certain plants that were useful to them, uh, including oak trees. Okay. Mm. 
Okay, so I'm going to talk through about six trees that are quite common around here that you can see either in an urban landscape or um, hiking in an open space preserve nearby. Um, I think the one that people readily sort of recognize the most would be the Coast Live Oak, uh, Quercus agrifolia. Um, anything with the term live in its title, pretty much it means it's an evergreen. So Coast Live Oak is an evergreen tree, so that's one distinguishing characteristic. Um, the appearance of the leaves can be pretty variable, but I think most people recognize um, sort of small oval shaped leaves with little barbs or spines on the outside. Um, one thing that distinguishes it particularly are these little hairs on the underside of the leaf. The leaf is often cupped, um, and if you flip it over, there tends to be these little hairs, which I'll show you in the next photo. Um, hairy armpits seems a little undignified for these um, very stately trees, but um, it tends to stick and people remember it, so I guess we'll, we'll go with it. Um, the acorns are conical and they have flat scaly, um, scaly caps. And if you look at the distribution of the tree, you can see why it's called a coast live oak. Um, it's you know, restrained to this belt uh, along the coast, although they can occur well inland. Um, to me, I always think of this as kind of like a workhorse tree in our area. It really reproduces very readily. If you look even in sort of the, um, the margins along the road that have terrible soil and weird plants growing in them, you'll a lot of times see coast live oak seedlings reaching their branches through. Uh, there's like construction gating near where I live and I always see um, coast live oak arms trying to come up through the fencing. So they really are um, really resilient trees. Um, okay. Uh, here, you, sorry, I don't know. Here you can see what are called the hairy armpits of the tree. Um, there's these fine little hairs that can occur where these side veins connect with the middle rib of the leaf. So that's one of the really solid defining characteristics of, um, of coast live oak trees in that picture from Thyana. Um, the valley oak is, I just have to admit, it's probably the easiest, I think it's the easiest to love. It's, it's our, it's a huge oak tree. It's a giant, one of the giants of our oaks. Um, you can see on the distribution map why it's called a valley oak. Um, they prefer fertile bottomland soil. They like a bit more moisture. Um, these are deciduous trees and they tend to have pretty deep lobing, as you can see. Um, they, I guess some people call them weeping oaks because their, their branches do tend to sort of go up and out and down to the ground um, unless they are pruned differently, which in the urban setting sometimes they are. But um, in their natural habitat, they're kind of like perfect climbing trees if you're a tree climber or you have kids who are tree climbers. Um, and they have really beautiful acorns that can get very large. Um, they have a warty cap that to me always looks like um, a little man in a beanie. Um, I think one of the things that made me want to talk about masting tonight is that I was in Arastradero a couple weeks ago and one of the valley oaks that I hiked by had a crazy amount of acorns on it. Um, it's just got me thinking about what's going on with the valley oaks this year. Um, so, and um, the valley oak to me is one of those trees that, um, you know, I always sort of counter when people say California has no seasons. California has seasons. You just have to look for them a little bit harder. Um, and this beautiful series of um, pictures of a valley oak by Val Lee, who's one of our, um, our staff member over at Burn in Los Altos Hills, shows the different seasons of the valley oak and how beautiful they are. So um, in this picture of like a fall valley oak, you can kind of see one of the mature acorns, which is this beautiful brown color. Um, and then you can see sort of a more wintry look where the tree's losing its leaves. And then you can see that beautiful, vibrant green that um, we see on the hillsides in the spring that's just so brief, but so beautiful. Um, so valley oaks, I think, are a great seasonal tree that allow you to appreciate um, our different seasons. Okay. Um, another oak that you can see that's um, closely related to the valley oak is the blue oak. 
Um, the blue oak really thrives in hot, dry foothills. It can tolerate probably the hottest weather maybe of any of the oak trees. Um, about half of oak woodlands in California are dominated by blue, art, blue oak. Um, and it really has some amazing adaptations to survive in some of the toughest environments of the state. Um, you can kind of see it doesn't, uh, in the distribution map, it's, um, it doesn't really need the fertile bottomland soil. It really likes the hot, dry foothills. Um, it, its acorns germinate quite early and it invests a lot of energy in its roots early on. Um, so the shoots or the leaves and branches grow relatively slowly. It's pretty slow growing. Um, but it can tolerate really dry weather. Um, the bluish coating on the leaf, which um, you can see in this picture, is a waxy leaf coloring covering to prevent water loss. Um, and you can kind of see some of it's rubbing off there. It's sort of like a succulent that it, some of that covering can come off if you rub it in your hand. Um, it's also deciduous like the valley oak. Um, and it can have quite um, rotund acorns um in shallow warty cups and the acorns do bear pretty good resemblance to valley oaks because they are um they are similar if they share a close evolutionary lineage um the black oak is um is kind of a montane species so um if you look at the range here oh sorry that's my blue oaks here's my black oaks the black oaks are distributed um, much more up in the mountains, um, so they tend to coexist uh, where there's more pine species. Um, Paul pointed out to me that they also really kind of like cold, so even if uh, you're not up high enough, if there's pockets of cold, um, you can find them there too. So he said there's a good stand in Hutter Park where there's an area that stays a little bit colder than the other ones, so I'm gonna have to check that out soon. Um, black refers to the bark of the tree. Um, it's also deciduous and I have um, some great pictures from Hannah on the next slide of what they look like when they're changing color. Um, the acorns were known to be the best tasting of California's indigenous people. Um, and these leaves are very deeply lobed, um, but they have a bristle on each end. Um, and the acorns are a bit more squat with a, a scaled cup. Um, a, a rather deep cup with scales. Um, so you have to usually get up to some elevation to see these trees, um, but they're really, really beautiful. So those are some pictures from Hannah of the black oaks. So they have really quite broad leaves. Hmm. Okay. okay, the next two oaks are where I have more trouble identifying. So I'm gonna go over the interior live oak and um, the canyon live oak. So the interior live oak, as the name suggests, it sounds kind of like the coast live oak, but it's not found as much on the coast. Um, but it's an evergreen tree. And in this picture right here, the leaves have these little teeth that, um, that look a lot like a coast live oak. So in that sense, they can be tough to distinguish. Um, this interior live oak has a very broad distribution. You can see it goes, it runs almost the length of California. So it's a pretty adaptable tree. And part of that adaptability um, means that it can look very different, even within the same plant, depending on where the leaves are growing. Um, it's, like I said, it has a huge range. Um, the leaves are leathery and flat. Um, they can be a bit yellowish on the undersides. The margins are just completely variable. They can be toothed at the bottom to um, protect against herbivory and smooth margins at the top. Um, but one thing that you can look for is the lack of hairy armpits. Um, and that can tell you if you're dealing with an interior live oak or a coast live oak. Um, the acorns actually take two years to mature um, and they're conical with a, with a scaled cup. So they don't have the warty cup that, um, the blue or the valley oaks have. Um, all right, and the canyon live oak, uh, which is Quercus chrysolepis. I learned this week that chrysolepis, chryso means gold and lepis means scales, um, which is I think the same as the lepidopteran roots. So the lepidopterans are the butterflies and moths and they are scaled. So that's a cool, a cool root there. Um, you see live oak in the common name, so they're evergreen. 
um, but they're called the gold scales um, oak because they have these acorns that are both sort of a gold, a gold color on the bottom when they're young. Um, but apparently if you take the acorn all the way out, you'll see really some gold, sort of fine gold hairs on the inside of the saucer. So this is one I'm planning on looking for in the next few weeks um, because the acorns really are, are very beautiful. Um, sometimes the, underneath the leaves, on the young leaves particularly, you'll see golden or silvery hairs underneath. And, and they just sometimes have sort of a hairy appearance in general. Again, the margins of the leaf won't help you much because they can really be smooth or spiny. Um, there's lots of other oaks in the urban environment. Um, this one, the one, the, the photograph is a holly oak. Um, that's the most common urban oak that's planted that's not native. It's, I think of it's kind of a generic looking oak. It's very well behaved. It doesn't tend to buckle the concrete and it grows really straight up, which is why people plant it. Um, and then, I don't know how many of you recognize this image, but it's Ferdinand the bull sitting under a cork tree. And cork oaks are actually pretty common in the urban environment. They don't actually have corks coming off them in these clusters, as you see here. Um, they have acorns like any other oak, but it's sort of a funny way to think about it. Um, okay, so I'm gonna switch over to talking about masting in oaks. And um, masting is, a reference to this behavior that's been recognized in oaks um, probably for as long as the indigenous people were here for using the oaks to gather food. Um, here I have a picture of a mortar stone that's actually at Skyline Ridge. It's actually really easy to walk to and see, um, which is, this is one of the rocks that um, indigenous people would grind the acorns in, making these amazing holes. Um, and this, person over here. This painting was made in the early 1400s. And while I like to think he's actually saluting those majestic looking oak trees in front of him, I read that he's actually about to throw a stick up into the top to knock the acorns from the top of the tree down to these rather fierce and hungry looking pigs. And masting actually comes from an old English word for, that is somewhat similar to mast that refers to all this excess, all these excess nuts on the ground that people have recognized for a long time. Certain years, there would just be lots of extra um, seeds and nuts from these oak trees that they could use to feed their livestock. And um, there's no, you know, there's no question that the indigenous people would have known this as well and recognized some of these cycles. Um, but it's only, um, you know, in relatively recent history that people have tried to answer the question of sort of how this happens and why this happens. Um, so I was just going to go over some of the hypotheses and um, some of the evidence. Um, so masting, when we say masting, it involves variability in seed production. So it's well recognized that an oak tree certain years will make almost no acorns at all. And then other years will create this bumper crop where there, it's just almost like stagging with acorns. Um, and part of masting is also synchrony that has been observed. So in certain species, in certain geographic areas, they do appear to synchronize their masting. So you might get the blue oaks in a geographic area having mast years that are correlated. Um, so it's an interesting sort of scientific mystery um, why and how this can happen, because it's, it's sort of not a typical way that plants reproduce. So um, two ideas about how this adaptation could have evolved um, is the predator satiation hypothesis, which is just the idea that if you're a tree that makes very delicious and energy rich seeds, um, it might be to your benefit every once in a while, every couple of years to make so many that your predators cannot possibly eat them all. Um, and that some of those animals like this scrub jay, who is one of the best planters of oak trees around, some of those animals are not gonna be able to find all the seeds that they cache and hide away, um, and that that might be an effective reproductive strategy. Um, the other hypothesis is that it might have to do with resource limitation for the tree. So a lot of these oaks live in um, extreme environments where there's a lot of water limitation. Um, and so another hypothesis is that, you know, 
reproduction is most efficient in these large bursts, and then the tree has to um, sort of replenish its resources, and that takes more than a year. And depending on the tree species, um, could take different amounts of time. Um, I'm, I'm going to highlight one study here um, by Walter Koenig, who has done a lot of masting studies in this area. And I think it's it highlights um, sort of what what questions have been answered and which questions haven't been answered locally. Um, and this figure that I am showing here, it's, it's really actually a very straightforward figure. It's a series of bar graphs and the bar, it, it was an experiment done over 10 years. And we have five different species. This was done at the Hastings Reserve in Monterey County. And the bars represent masting. So a big bar will be a masting year. Um, and so what you see is that overall, if you trace year by year, the five species are not masting at the same time. So that's one question, like do all oak trees mast at the same time? They definitely don't do that. And that wouldn't really maybe make any sense. Um, but you also see that the trees aren't really, um, even some of the species um, do or don't mast together. So really the one relationship that's sort of clear is that the valley oak and the blue oak, which are these first two rows, those are showing synchrony and masting. So that probably has something to do with their close evolutionary lineage. But otherwise, the, all this, the five species are not really masting in synchrony. And the author found that what this meant as far as overall availability of acorns was that acorn availability was actually pretty constant year over year. So even though we're able to observe trees producing this crazy bumper crop um, certain years, um, it looks like enough trees are, are masting differently in different years that there's a relatively steady source of acorns. And this was at one reserve where there's five species of oaks um, sort of occurring in the same area. Um, and that's obviously important for species that have co-evolved with oaks. So I have an acorn woodpecker here um, using an, an oak as a granary tree. Um, and there's an amazing abundance of species that use these oaks. And so sort of one of the, I think the ideas from this paper might be that it's probably important to maintain different species of oak trees in our area, in areas where um, we have a lot of wildlife um, to keep that source of acorns pretty constant. Um, so that was one suggestion from this paper. And they tried to sort of put a, a, psych, a time frame on the cycling of these, uh, um, of these oak trees. And they sort of put um, Deglassii and Agrifolia, they seem to mass on about a three year cycle. Um, Chrysolepis and Calogii took much longer. It looked like maybe six years, but it wasn't really a long enough study to, um, to tell. And then it looked like uh, Quercus lobata or valley oak maybe masted every two to three years. But another big finding of the study was that individual variation actually still played a huge role with each tree. Um, the answer to how oaks mast is kind of, we still don't know. Um, there's a lot of scientists who've tried to study a lot of different variables that could relate. Um, they've looked at chemical signaling from tree to tree. Um, they've looked at responses to environmental cues along every kind of gradient you could think of from water throughout the year, wind, um, heat, in, you know, heat in the winter, heat in the spring, um, and there haven't really been clear answers, I wouldn't say, that I've found. Um, pollen coupling is another hypothesis and has to do with how the flowering occurs in the spring. Um, this figure is a uh, a study of masting on, on East Coast oaks and just I like this figure because it demonstrates the amount of interaction that happens based on the productivity of these oak trees. And this particular study found that in masting years um, there was an increase in mice and deer who are acorn predators and that was bad for birds because mice eat bird eggs and it was bad for moths or it just it resulted in de decreased populations of birds and moths. And it re resulted in increased populations of ticks and corresponding Lyme disease cases that year. So that was sort of like an interesting relationship between Lyme's disease in this particular study and masting um, that is not initially obvious. Um, so it's kind of interesting. And in, in low mast years or low acorn crop years, 
you see the opposite. Um, oaks are keystone species. Um, they are the foundation for so much life in our area. Um, one interaction that I've sort of thought through this year um, is that, you know, our field staff noticed that it was a big snake year this year. There seemed to be a lot more snakes than we're used to seeing. Um, and we also saw our first weasel, and I had to have an excuse to put this picture of the weasel uh, in the slideshow. So here it is. Um, but both, uh, both snakes and weasels eat mice and voles. Um, and those mice and voles are acorn eater, eaters, so it's possible that there was a major masting event one to two years ago, um, but I think it would be really interesting going forward to keep track of these masting cycles and see if we can connect it to things like snakes and weasels. Um, I don't know if we want to do questions, Hannah. I think we might want to hand it straight over to Paul. So one of the interesting things about oaks is that they hybridize very readily but only in the group in which they belong. So the three groups we have in California are the black oak group, which is the California black oak, black oak the coast live oak, the interior live oak, and the shreve oak, which grows out near the coast. Um, they all have one thing in common, and that is the cap is scaly. They should all have two-year acorns, except the coast live oak doesn't. So that doesn't follow. But they all can hybridize and produce intermediates. The white oak group consists of the valley, the blue, the scrub, the leather, and the Oregon oak. We may only have a few Oregon oaks locally today, but I believe that the Oregon oak has left its genes here in the Pleistocene in my blue oak in the backyard has odd acorns and odd growth habit. Since all of these can hybridize, you can end up with a real messy uh, identification problem in the white oak group. And then the other one, the gold cap oaks, um, the golden oaks, canyon live oak, and the huckleberry oak. That's not local, but it's in the Sierra. And if you want to see a really interesting phenomenon, you start in the valley floor of Yosemite, and they're all canyon live oaks. As you go up the uh, four mile trail to Glacier Point, they become all huckleberry oaks. And you can watch them change as you go up the hill. It is a climatic change that takes the hybrid between them right in the middle and then changes it to huckleberry oak at the top. So if you have these ones that do not hybridize between the groups, perhaps you could actually say that the um, oaks are three genera in California. In the world, there are five oaks groups. There are two in Europe we don't have here, one of which is the uh, one that the um, cork oak is in. Don't know if that's true or not, but you could also say that this is all actually one species and that you're just looking at ones that take um, a certain habitat. So a valley oak will be growing where you have a deep soil and plenty of water. Blue oak where it's hot and dry. Scrub oaks where it's really well drained, hot, and shallow soils. Leather oak where there are um, serpentine soils. And the Oregon oak needs to be further north and get more water than any of these can um, handle. So I'm gonna go and say the one thing that's really interesting when we start to look at the oak galls is that there are different galls in each one of these groups. The galls can trans traverse some of these species and show relationships between them, but they do not go across to the other groups. So I'm going to move on to what the oak galls is. Where is it? Stop sharing that. 
There we go. Is everybody seeing the gall wasp encyclopedia? Yep. Yeah. And there are pictures here of what gall wasps look like. These are tiny little wasps that produce, it's one family, it's um, cypid wasps, and this family all have this kind of form. You see here is a parasitic wasp, and this is a parasitic wasp, but this is the typical form of a gall wasp. And what they have in common is that they go to the oaks and they cause galling, which are these structures. They have a complicated lifestyle, they have parasites, they have ones that don't produce a gall but use some other insects or a gall wasps, galls. It is a very big ecosystem. I'm going to go show you just some of the ones that I've taken pictures of here in the area. Um, I've traveled a little bit to pick up some of the ones that aren't in our area, but you will see how many there are. And I'm going to stop sharing this one, and we're going to go to off and running. So I'm going to start with the black oak group. And this is the gall of the oak, or black oak um, apple gall. Well, you say that doesn't look much like an apple, does it? That's because this wasp has two generations. One generation is this one. This is the spring generation, and it's the sexual one. You have bisexual wasps, so they're male and female. That goes to this gall. Doesn't look very uh, much the same, does it? That to that. It's the same insect. The difference here is all of the um, larvae in this are females. And they will come out females and they'll come in the fall and they'll lay eggs for the next generation for the gall you just saw. And you're wondering how does that happen? Well, Hymenoptera has a very unusual way of determining sex. And that is, if you are a um, fertilized egg, you will develop into a female. If you don't fertilize the egg, it still hatches, but it's a male. And the females are able to control this very well. And so you end up with things like this, where you have two generations, one that's male and female, they mate, all females come out of it and then go back to the other one. This is what the gall looks like after it has released the wasp. These are the exit holes. This is a beautiful little gall that you see on um, uh, coast live oaks if you look very closely. You will notice from its name down here with the cursor, Calrithsis quercus agrifolia. They often name the galls for the tree they are found on. This is only found on coast live oaks. This is another one. This is Andrus spectabilis. It's a big stem gall. Obviously, this one has done its thing, and the wasps have left. Does anybody see where the gall is on this one? It's here. This is a stem gall, but it's the uh, leaf petiole that it galls. And when it dries up, you can see that the gall has, or the wasp has exited that leaf and caused the leaf to die. This stem is galled. You see it's rather wide and thick. And what it turns into is this. This is uh, Purdens, Calorithus Purdens, and it's called the um, erupting gall. And I actually caught it at the point where it erupts. This is a larval chamber being forced out of the stem. It breaks open the edge of the um, stem, and these things come popping out. It's very dramatic. Here's another picture of them coming out, just starting to come out of that gall. 
My feeling well, on this is- Do you mind it, if I ask a question real quick? Sure. So um, we had a question about how does the wasp make the gall and for all of these different kinds of galls, ah. is the process the same? Yes, it's a interaction between the insect and the genes of the tree. So the insect has chemicals or when it's feeding the uh, irritation that it does causes these particular forms to develop. And some of them are spectacular. These are very commonly the stem galls. It's just a enlargement of the area. But what they do is they're causing this food and shelter structure for the insect's larvae. Does that make sense to everybody? <laughs> okay. And because they have to interact with the genes of the plant, the plant has to have the right genes for the gall to work. It won't work if you go to a different plant. So galls can occur on everything. Here's one. This is um, Calrissus congregata, and it's the um, called the sausage gall because it takes the stems of the male flowers and causes them to inflate like this, forming what looks like a sausage. Even more particular is the next one, where each individual flower is. Um, galled, and this is Circonus. Obviously, this one has to beat out when the plant is flowering, so it's only found when the plant is flowering, and I have found that you usually find this only by waterways. You can go out and look at Quercus agri, this is on Quercus agrifolia. If you get away from the streams, you don't find it. If you get near a stream, you will. This tiny little gall is uh, got a great name, Dubious. It's got two little horns on the end here, and look how tiny it is. This is my finger. It's on. This is on the um, Quercus cologgii. I'd been looking for this for years, and we went out on a uh, um, area to look for. Uh, I don't remember what the field trip was, and I saw. Kalagi I said, oh, I'm going to look for galls on that one, and here this one was. And then there's one like this. I'm going to blow it up for you. It's a spot in the middle with these long hairs coming out. Now, the problem with that is I couldn't find anything in the gall book that looked like that. Whoops. Really funny looking thing. But there is one. Um, hetero, uh, heterocis, heterocis, uh, disica called the um, oh, common name is the uh, fuzzy gall. This may be just the beginning of it. You sometimes find galls before they've completely developed, and you won't find them in the gall book because they're not the fully developed gall. I have now moved to the white oak group, and the most spectacular gall in the white oak group is this one called the um, oak apple gall, Andricus quercus californicus. It's only found in California. And here's a real good example of why they call it the oak apple gall. It is, can be just as red as an apple. And it will be found on mostly valley oaks, but it'll also be found on blue oaks. And I think the reason why it's, it's by the way, the largest gall in California, maybe one of the largest in uh, the world. You know how big they can get. Um, some of them up to a couple inches in diameter. It's a war between the woodpeckers and the um, larvae. It's bigger the gall, the harder the woodpecker has to work to get to the uh, larvae to eat them. And so as the time goes on, the gall gets bigger and the woodpecker works harder. 
This is one of my favorite galls. This is the turban gall, Antron de Glacii. It's these beautiful pink galls with spikes on them, spike turban gall. And sometimes there can just be masses of them on the leaves. This is uh, at a rastrodero, and we're looking at the undersides of the leaves. That's where they gall the plant. We have an example here where you can see the developing gall. This is the beginning. This is a little bit further along. This is almost fully mature, and these are fully mature ones. Another one related to that one is this one, um, Quercus uh, echinus. This is the urchin gall. Now, the urchin gall likes it where it's hotter. I have never seen that locally. You can go down to Coyote Valley and you can find them down there, but where I found them in abundance was in the Great Valley and the Blue Oaks along the edge of the valley. And they come in two forms. This is the red form, and this is the white tip form. They are spectacular little galls. This one is on the uh, Oregon oak, so you have to go further north to see this one, and it's spectacular. It's the Stelly gall. And Andricus stellaris. These are crystalline galls, and this is actually on a blue oak on my property. And that may look like one gall, but it's actually a cluster of galls that grow together, sometimes so tightly you can't see the lines. But when you break it apart, you see the individual galls look like this. And this one is crystallinus. Or crystallinus. Then there are the cool galls like this one. This one is the clasping stem gall. And you'll notice this top part here is uh, darker and has little pits in it. Those exude sap, sweet sap that draws ants. And the ants then protect the gall from parasites and predators. So it's one of these things that the gall has developed a way of finding a protective species by finding genes in the plant that will make this happen. And this is Dysoclaspus prehensis, prehensa. And there's another species that's similar, and there's the top here where the sap is put out, and here is an ant right here. This is an Argentine ant here, there's one here. They will, if you start disturbing these, these ants will go right after you. Oops. And this one is Mellifica. This is a uh, Modera Pattersonii, Pattersonia. And this one's a younger gall, and this is the mature gall. This one then will fall off the leaf, so you have to be out at just the right time to find these. These were found on a blue oak at uh, Jasper Ridge. Very interesting patterns of spike, uh, spotting on them. Um, this one's uh, Andrinkus gigas. Uh, almost always found on blue oaks. I consider them a, what it looks like a splash gall. They're one of the disc galls. And it looks like somebody hit it with a drop of water and it's splashing out. And another disc gall is this one. This is uh, Parmula. And it's a shiny, beautiful gall. This is an example of the smaller, intermediate, and almost mature and here are the mature galls. They're just really, really interesting little galls. They're very tiny, by the way, as you can see. And we're going to talk about this one next. Oh, wait, no. We're going to go to the wig gall. Doesn't look like it very much of anything. It's uh, Falewa away. All in the same genus. 
And this one is King, King AI, also known as the Red Cone Gall. This was called the Wig Gall. I don't know if I told you the, the name of it. And sometimes you find them all together. Here's the Red Cone Gall, the Wig Gall, and the Just Gall. And I caught this happening. So this is a parasitic wasp. This is not the ovipositor, this is the sheath of the ovipositor. If you look right here, this little thing right there, that is the animal's uh, egg laying device. She is drilling into the bottom of this gall to take it over. Um, her larvae is going to get in there and uh, use that gall for, and the insect inside for its food. I have seen this twice. This one was in Jasper Ridge and I saw one at Burn Preserve doing the same thing. The uh, red cone galls can get to very high levels. Of, you can go out and find just millions of them out on the bottoms of leaves. But look closely because sometimes you may find that it's a different gall. This is uh, um, Atromet, Metis, Mentis, and this is the striped volcano, volcano gall, a different species. This is, I think you know what the name with this would be. It's a club gall, Clavo, um, Clavioides. And this is a spring gall, it, it find, only found in the spring. And I had been looking for this for years. But there was a windstorm this spring and a piece of my blue oak stem blew off the tree and there they were. Must be up in the top of the tree. And it's early in the spring when the um, leaves are right, quite um, young. Dross um, pedicellitus. Yeah, <laughs> typical uh, Round gall, there's lots of these, and you have to look, by the way, to know the species by looking where this gall is. There are some that are on a stem, and those are a different species. This one is always on the mid vein of the leaf and almost always on valley oaks. Andricus confertus. This one is always found on two species. And they're close related species, and they show the relationship between the two species. This is a um, beet gall, um, Deschioclapus plumbella, and I call them a strawberry gall because they look like strawberries. You find them on leather oaks, and you find them on um, scrub oaks. This is the urn gall, looks like a little urn sitting there. Um, Phytoterus cupula. You would think that's a gall? It is. Um, this is on a blue oak and what it does, it makes this stem look like a whole bunch of little leaves all together. Andricus wiltzia. Zilia. And then sometimes you find something and you go, I could not find anything that looks like this in the book. And the book is a lot of galls that I haven't seen, I haven't taken pictures of. Took this down in the Central Valley. It's obviously stem gall. It may be immature and therefore I can't tell what it is, but I couldn't come up with an ID. So actually going out and looking for galls, you may find new ones, new species. I am now moving to the uh, intermediate oaks. We've been through uh, the white oaks, a very large number of galls on white oaks. The Chrysoleptus has uh, this one, which I think looks like a Hershey's Kiss or a home that the uh, Smurfs would live in. And uh, it's Heterococcus centisclaria. Anyway, it's a really interesting looking gall. Mushroom, whatever. 
Then there's this one. This I have a couple of this Pacifica, and this is one that's immature. And as they mature, they develop this pattern on them. And uh, this is a very mature one. And they're, they're found mostly on huckleberry oaks. I have not seen them on the mall oak. And then there's this one. I think this is still that same gall, but this is probably what happens when another uh, gall wasp takes over the gall and it changes its form. I have not found this in the book to know for sure. It obviously attracts ants. This was a Heterococcus vesens. It's not a very exciting gall. It's on the edges of the leaves of uh, the huckleberry oak. Now this is the one that I really like. This is the oak apple equivalent for the intermediate oaks. Um, I'm not sure how to say vexinifolia. It's on the, uh, found on the huckleberry oak, but this is what makes it really cool. That's what's inside. It looks like the control center of some spacecraft with all these you know, connecting wires coming out of the computer to control things. And each one of those connections is where these dots are on the edge. I think this is probably a way of discouraging predators because they poke open the gall and there's nothing in there. This is the larval chamber right here. So that's all the gall pictures I have. Um, if you ever want to look at these, um, I believe, let's see, this is, this is all on my Flickr account. And my Flickr account is L-O-G-H-3-O. And you can find this in a folder called Oak Galls. And this is the I will folder. link your Flickr account on the... Um, okay. I think I can get my name up so you can copy it. Yeah, here, here's the na name right here, HTDH3O. So what I've shown you is how much the oaks are supporting one tiny family of wasps. This is the only one insect family, one small one in the Hymenoptera. Above that are things like Lepidoptera. There are some 450 species on oak trees in the east, and I'm sure that is uh, equivalent to each species out here. These trees are covered with insects. They attract birds like you would not believe. I have all these birds come to my oak looking for food and they find it. I've had titmice year after year come and successfully nest by going just up to the tree, grabbing caterpillars and bringing them down, feeding their young. I had a bluebird this year. I don't know what it was catching, but it was right there you know, feeding their young and fledged out five uh, blue chicks. So it's really an interesting plant to have. If you have one plant in your yard, it should be an oak and one of the native oaks.